the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit may be truly wise. Never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Fatima, pray, pray for us. us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Saint Luke. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts of them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house. But it did not collapse. It had been set solidly on rock. Everyone who listens to these words of mine but does not act on them will be like a fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house, and it collapsed and was completely ruined. Jesus finished these words. The crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening. Adrian Rogers, the Baptist minister, tells a story of a multimillionaire that decided that he was going to build a series of uh, million dollar houses and then sell them out. So he bought a huge land, a lot, and he started to build these houses. Then given that it was a good time, he sold them out pretty quickly. But after about a year and a half, two years, the houses started to uh, crumble and collapse. There was one house, and then the second house, and the third house, and the fourth house, there, there, um, foundation started to just cave in. It turned out that these houses were built over an old gar garbage dump. So all of them had to be t torn down. I see that related to the gospel I just read, Matthew chapter 7. Our uh, spiritual edifices cannot be built upon feelings, emotions, political ideologies. Rather, our house has to be built upon rock, and that's Christ. And those who are here this evening, that rock has to be our daily holy hour. We have to be faithful to our daily holy hour, whether or not we feel like it or not. Because sometimes we have a lot of emotions, a lot of feelings, uh, other times less so. Other times we'll be uh, as dry as a desert. So uh, we have to make a firm commitment to pray irrespective of the coming and going of feelings. No? Prayer is not, does not depend upon feelings, but it descend, it, depends upon the act of the will. Okay, so that's an interpretation of that biblical passage. I'd like to move into, um, we finish 138 in the diary. That means we'll follow up with 139. Huh? 
Okay, so, still a soul which is faithful to God cannot confirm its own inspirations. So if you, have, you get inspirations, you, have, you can't confirm them by yourself. You have to have some type of authority outside yourself to confirm whether or not they come from the good spirit, the bad spirit, or the human spirit. That's what she's saying. It must submit them to the control of every very wise and learned priest. And until it is quite certain, it should remain distrustful. So, the... Um, the approved uh, apparition of, of, uh, of the Sacred Heart, as well as Divine Mercy, it came about through Saint Ma Margaret Maria Lecoq in the 1600s, and then Saint Faustina, who lived in the 20th century. These are two great saints, great saints, but their private their private uh, revelations, their inspirations, their um, locutions that they had within, the operations they had from without, these had to be confirmed and verified by an exterior source who happened to be their spiritual director. And their spiritual director, in the case of St. Margaret Maria Le Cook, is a canonized saint and St. Faustine had two spiritual directors. One uh, is a blessed, and the other one is not yet. So if it were not through, for Father Sapochko, Father Andras, as well as St. Claude de la Colombière, we would, not have, we would not have these beautiful images of the Sacred Heart in your homes, nor will we have this Divine Mercy image that I have on my right. So these are two great saints but it had to be confirmed by the church and by um, very well-trained uh, spiritual directors. And these happen to be saints. I could also say this with respect to the, the teachings of Teresa of Avila. Teresa of Avila would have never gone um, going about the Reformation of the Carmelite Order if she did not have the approval and support of various spiritual directors that are canonized saints. They would be St. John of the Cross, of course, St. Peter of Alcantara, a Franciscan mystic and ascetic, and St. Francis Borgia, who happened to be also a Jesuit priest. Okay, so that's important. A lot of people come to the priest with their with, with their dreams and their visions, and I pretty skeptical. <laughs> pretty skeptical. It's more important to be patient with your husband, it's really getting on your case and, uh, you know, mortify yourself by, by, by not eating, eating chocolate on Friday when those, those apparitions you have, okay? Yeah, dreams are sometimes pretty suspect. Pretty suspect, no? So you, uh, and then, well, the, the, the proof would be this. If that dream is helping you to be more prayerful, more mortified, more obedient, more faithful to your state of life, more faithful to your, your, um, your plan of life, okay, well, bring on the dreams. But if they're not going to help you to be more faithful and servant of God, what's the purpose? No? And you don't want to be basing your life on, on the dream world either, do you? You have to live in reality. 
But there are a lot of people that really, their dreams and their, they, 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 they give so much credence to that that um, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay. It should not even, not, should not on its own initiative alone put its trust in these inspirations and all other higher graces because it can thus expose itself to great losses. Even though soul may immediately distinguish between false inspirations and those of God, it should nevertheless be careful because many things are uncertain. Okay, trying to connect this with the Ignatian spirituality. If there's ever an inspiration in which this goes against the, the Ten Commandments, or this goes against the teaching of the church, that's very suspect. Okay, that's very suspect. If it goes against the commandments, or it goes against the, the magisterial teaching of the church, because the Holy Spirit is not going to be te- not is not going to be contradicting what what Jesus teaches through the church. It's just not the way the Holy Spirit works. But then, uh, in the second set of rules, Ignatius points out that even the bad spirit can inspire, can 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 give you good thoughts. So he says, Ignatius says, in the second series of rules, you have to study the whole evolution of that thought process. You have to study where it came from, how it developed, and how it ended. So if it starts out being good, then as it, as it progresses, it's good. In the middle of the thought process is good, and the end of it is good, and that comes from the good spirit. But if it's good, 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 and then, then it becomes somewhat suspicious and suspect, that could be the tale of the enemy. As we read in St. Paul, uh, the devil can d- disguise himself as an angel of light. As an angel of light. God is pleased and rejoices when his soul distrusts him him for his own sake. Because it loves him, it is prudent and itself asks and searches for help to make certain that it is really God who is acting within it. And once a well-instructed confessor has confirmed this, the soul should be at peace and give itself up to God according to his directions. That is, according to the directions of the confessor. Now what Faustina does is sometimes she um, she will um, speak about the confessor as spiritual director. And I think in vocabulary, I have to kind of, it's good to differentiate. Now, a confessor can be a spiritual director. But it's not always the case. For example, I have, I have, I have a confessor. I have a confessor, but, but I have a spiritual director. They're, they're two different people. So I'm just saying that you have to be kind of careful when you're reading St. Faustina because um, she will sometimes connect both of them. And for, for example, Father Sapochko and Father Andrash, they are her confessor, but also they're her spiritual director. And that's not always the case.
But I really see the role, I see, really see the role as very different. Simple, if I go to, when I go, when I go for a spiritual, when I go for a spiritual direction, it's going to be usually a 45 minute conversation. Uh, Sometimes maybe a little bit less, a little bit more, depending on what's going on in my life. Whereas today, this morning, this morning I heard more than a hundred confessions, okay? Each one was two minutes. Some was 90 seconds. These are the first communion kids, no? I mean, that doesn't take a long time, no? It's so really the purpose of confession is the confession of sins and the absolution and forgiveness of sins. That's the primary purpose. About six months ago, I did intervene, I mean, speaking about the different roles that a priest can play as confessor, right? Remember? As teacher, as educator, as counselor, as consoler, as friend, as judge, as, uh, I mean, I gave you about 10 different minor roles, but basically the priest as confessor is Christ the healer. But I want to be, I, mean, I don't want to be contra contradicting myself. You can, I, I've told people, if you want me to be your spiritual director, okay, you can confess in three minutes and I'll give you another five minutes. So it's all done in eight minutes. So a, lot, a lot of people don't like that. Well, fine. Uh, it's just that I don't, I don't have too much time if you're able to, after you confess, if you, if you have German blood, you're able to basically give the topic, be very succinct, and I happen to have German blood also, you know, you give it to me, and I'll give you a very clear response, five or six minutes. So if you're coming to confess, if you're, if you're doing that every two or three weeks, I think that's feasible. Father Tim Gallagher says that that is a way in which you can um, ca kill those two birds with one stone. Is that clear? Okay. Now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, once again, the spiritual director and the directee. We have, we have a lot of lay, uh, lay directors here helping us out immensely, and there's several here with me, and some are in formation. Okay, Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Avila highlights the, the three salient points of a good spiritual director should be holiness, learning, and prudence. Holiness, a man or a man of God, a prayer. Learning has to know his theology. And when I say theology, that is moral theology, spiritual theology, dogmatic theology. And then when Teresa of Avila says prudence, uh, Prudence used uh, theologically is different than, as we say in American jargon, be prudent. In American jargon, being prudent means be careful. That has nothing to do with the theological moral virtue of prud prudence. But if you hear people say, be prudent, you know, be careful. No? That has nothing to do with the, the, mor the moral virtue of prudence. Uh, prudence is the art of decision making and is perfected by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit called counsel. So counsel perfects prudence. According to Thomas Aquinas, a prudential act has three specific steps and it is deliberation, 
uh, decision. And imperation is the word that Thomas Aquinas gives, which means imperation means you know you carry it out. You have to deliberate. Deliberate means you got to think, you got to ponder. Then you have to decide. Then the decision has to be the imperation of the will means you got to you have to carry out that decision that you made. That's called a prudential. That, that, that's called acting, uh, acting with the moral virtue of prudence. And what helps you to really live that out well is the is a gift the Holy Spirit is called counsel. So counsel actually it perfects the moral or cardinal virtue of prudence. So a good spiritual director should have that, okay? especially if, if he's Ignatian. Ignatian spirituality helps us, it, it trains us how to reason properly, both, both faith and reason. Faith and reason. Fides ratio, John Paul II. Okay. okay. Um, now, okay what, about, okay, what about you who are, who, you who are the directees? You see how they get the director, the directees. Um, first if, is if you, if, you don't, if you don't have a spiritual director, you should have one. All those who are in Perseverance Group uh, you, by now, you, you should all have a, you should all have a spiritual director. You all should. Uh, if you don't, uh, then you're going to stagnate in your spiritual life and you're never going to grow. You'll arrive at a certain point, then you'll stagnate, then you'll plateau out, then you'll fizzle out. Okay? Sorry, I mean, that's, uh, that's just that's good classical spiritual theology. That's Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, it's St. Ignatius. No? So if you don't have one, okay, you've got to pray. Pray that God will send you one. You've got to pray. Third, once, that you, once you, have, you have you found one, then it's important that before you have spiritual direction, you should prepare for it. I don't think it's a good idea to wing it, no? Or if you're just saying, Father, you asked me questions. That's, uh, that's not the way it should be done, my humble opinion, no? Rather, you should prepare yourself before. I think it's a good idea to have a diary or a journal, and you write down, you're going to write down what are those things that you want to address in the spiritual direction meeting? Have a, have a journal. Write them down. And then uh, it, embarks, uh, it, it embarks a lot of different facets, but the essence of spiritual direction is, is how... Can you improve your relationship with God? How can you, you improve your relationship with God? And of course, that's going, that's going to entail uh, your prayer life. Is your prayer life, is your prayer life, is it progressing or not? That's the very heart of it. I can't imagine, I mean, how you can go to spiritual direction and you're not talking about your prayer life. I mean, that's just, for me, it's just, I can't imagine it, no? I go to my spiritual director, that's the first thing I talk about. This is how my prayer has gone over the past month. No? And I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Well, I'll, I'll talk for about 10 minutes, no? 
and then he'll listen and then he'll usually intervene and interject and maybe suggest no. How on earth are you going to grow in your prayer life if you don't talk about it? You tell me. Hello? Yeah, you're not going to grow. You don't talk about your prayer life. I mean, you've got to talk to God when you pray. You have to talk, you have to talk about your prayer life with, with a direct other way. You're not going to grow. Then once you start to talk about it, you see how, how the Holy Spirit is working, what are some of the obstacles, what are some of the roadblocks, what are the, some of the inspirations. And then you grow in your prayer life, you're growing holiness. If you're growing your prayer life, then you're growing your relationship with, with God, and that's the essence of spiritual direction. Amen? Now, how, would, how does God speak to us in many ways? Uh, God, uh, God bombards us with his presence in many different ways. But I'll give you three primary ways in which we have to be able to hear the voice of God and read his presence. Okay, the first is, the first and foremost is the, is, is the word of God. Is the word of God. God speaks through his word. Second is that God, this is the principle and foundation, man is created. God speaks through creation. Now people, live in, who, people who live in a city like L.A., that's tough. The Argentinians call it uh, una selva de cemento, a, a jungle, a, a cement jungle, okay? But then also God, God speaks through, through people and through circumstances. Okay, God speaks through people. People that you meet on a daily basis, that's not happenstance, but that's divine providence. God has placed those people in your path. Whether you like them or not, okay? <laughs> maybe you don't like them, and maybe they don't like you, but God is allowing those people to be in your daily or weekly walk. Then circumstances. Circumstances. Nothing happens by chance. I've told you once, I'll tell you again. If you want to get me angry, say, good luck, Father. Uh -uh. I will gently rebuke you. What you just said is against the first commandment. I don't believe in luck, do you? I don't believe in luck. That happened, it was good because I had a lucky charm in my pocket. Oh, come on. Because I was, I had my back pocket, I had a, I had a three leaf clover. Come on, four leaf clover. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's superstition. Superstition. Divine providence is the word. God leads all events according to his providential design, providential care. And you know, if you want, if you, re, if you rewind the film of your life, especially we're on Thanksgiving weekend, I'm keenly aware of um, just rewinding, you know, 62 and a half years, no? I see God's hand in my life. And that's the beauty of the daily examine. You see God, God's life in, 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 in the bitter moments that we all experience, the suffering that we're going through. We see God's presence there. 
but in the lights and the insights and the inspirations and people that God has placed in our path. That's why the daily examine for Ignatius is indispensable. He, he never dispenses you from making your daily examine. Never. Even if you're sick, you can be laying in a bed there and you can go through what happened during the course of the day. But probably that's the prayer that we're all weakest at. Hello? We're probably all, all weakest at that because of a lack of courage and humility and fear. I think, well, I think we're afraid to look at ourselves in the mirror. I think there's a lot of fear. But why should we be afraid of God? I mean, our God loves us. Everything he does is for our own benefit. Okay, I think we have enough time for one more number. We have arrived at 140. Pure love is capable of great deeds. So true. And is not broken by difficulty or adversity. As it remains strong in the midst of great difficulty, so too it perseveres in the toilsome and the drab of drab life of each day. Talk a little bit about that. He's talking about love. He's talking about love. He's capable of great deeds. Now, the great deeds, uh, obviously, at least for me, would be the heroism of the martyrs. Yesterday, St. Cecilia or Maximilian Kolbe. Or today, if you're Mexican, you're, in, you're, you're, you're celebrating as well as Mary, one of your favorites. Right, Raquel? Miguel Pro. Blessed Miguel Pro is today. We've got a statue of Joselita Sanchez, Sanchez, the new catechetical, the patron of the confirmation kids. We got someone like Maria Goretti, right? We got someone like Maximilian Kolbe. We have someone like Saint John of Beretta Mola, okay? the doctor saint. A week from today, we'll have someone like Saint Andrew, who was on the cross for about three to four days, roped in the form of an X. All these, these are the, uh, the great deeds, or some of like St. Joan of Arc, okay? I mean, burnt at the stake. Or um, for Annette, the, the Japanese martyrs, right? So they, they ran to the cross, wanting to be crucified, and they, then they sang the Te Deum, right? When they were hanging on the cross, about to be thrust through by a sword. I don't know about you people, but I, I really, I really admire, I, I, I admire the martyrs. You're almost fearful when you read them. You say, wow, I'm, I get a toothache, toothache I'm complaining, right? Now the water in the, in the shower is not 85 degrees, I'm complaining, right? Here are these men and women, they're born with flesh and blood like this, but they're so, they're so heroic. That heroism obviously comes from the Holy Spirit. But you know, um, kind of what hit me today, though, in preparing this talk is, so too it perseveres in the toilsome and the drab life of each day. The word that I wrote down was the grind. You know what that means? The grind, and I was just kind of mulling through that whole whole idea the whole day. The the grind, you know. The grind, no. 
I'll talk a little about my experience, and I'll talk a little bit about how you experience that. The fact that I, I, I basically I was, you know, in the confessional five hours this morning, I knew I knew it was going to be uh, very grinding. I didn't sleep well last night. I knew it was going to be it's going to be real. Uh, <laughs> And what, you know, can I tell you one thing? I knew it was going to be a real grind. These kids are making their first confession. Uh, but you know, I want them. I want them to say the Attic contrition. These kids, they can't read yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you got a BA in languages. No. Yeah. It was five hours of. <laughs> and I, I knew that was going to be the case. I mean, I, I, I didn't lose. I didn't lose my patience. I was good spirits and very encouraging. But. <laughs> Uh, that's that for me. That's the grind. No, that's a grind. I think all of you have to confront this, because well, you all have it, right? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, that would be one example of life of a priest. Okay, I've got five hours of grind this morning. Uh, uh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No. Okay. Um, How many, okay, how many, how many mothers here? Is there a lot of grind in the life of a mother? Yes. But really, I mean, you know, when, you're, when you're married, you're first married, you're in your honeymoon, everything is great, you're married to the most handsome man in the world, okay? And after a week, you recognize he's got bad breath in the morning, right? <laughs> But then the, 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 the grind of preparing the meals every day, right, Erica? Then you got to wash the dishes. Okay, then you got to do that day after day after day. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a grind. But if it's, if it's, the idea is if it's done with love, it's very pleasing to God. you gotta, you got to supernaturalize this the whole work you're doing. So if it can be done, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? It can be done with cheerfulness and joy. That's more pleasing to God. He used to say, whistle while you work, right? right. Now, who did this was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes. Mary would have to prepare the meals. Mary would have to do the washing. Mary would have to be do the all those domestic chores that um, that are part and parcel of being a wife and a mother. She did it, but she did it joyfully. That's why mothers who are dedicated to the domestic chores. Mary is your model. Mary is your model. Now, if you, if, if most of you work outside the house, there's going to be a certain amount of grind in that too. One of the last jobs I had was I worked at, in Massachusetts on General Motors assembly line. Okay. Ah, e equally. <laughs> Every 90 seconds, the car came by, had the air pistol with a piston, and they threw a plastic mat in the back of it. Every 90 seconds, for eight hours. But 
They paid me enough to be able to pay for a good part of my college. No complaint. <laughs> but it was a grind. So all of your work, you probably have a certain amount of grind that is part and parcel of, of working. And I think what St. Faustina is saying is this drab, this grind, this toil, it has to be sanctified. We have to elevate our intentions to a supernatural mode. You've heard this many times. You're doing the ordinary with extraordinary love. There you have it. The ordinary with extraordinary love. There you have it. The ordinary with extraordinary love. She said, knows that only one thing is needed to please God, to, de- to do even the smallest things out of great love. Love and always love. And the smallest things out of great love. Love and always love. Don't you love that? Pure love never errors. Its light is strangely plentiful. It will not do anything that might displease God. It is ingenious at doing what is more pleasing to God. And no one will equal it. It is happy when it can empty itself and burn like a pure offering. The more it gives of itself, the happier it is. But also, no one can sense dangers from afar as can love. It knows how to unmask and also knows with whom it has to deal. There, okay, it's not said here uh, explicitly, but how often in our lives have we done certain actions for our own honor and glory? How often has it happened we've done it maybe for motives of vanity? How often has it happened we want, uh, we want, We want a pat on our back. We want some accolades. We want some applauses. We want to be honored. I think that we're all, we're all, I am, we're we're all guilty of this now and then. We want to be recognized. We want to be taken into account. We want to be affirmed. We want to be acknowledged. In other words, what she's saying is we kind of, kind of have to dig deep to see what is really motivating in our actions. It should be A, M, D, G. It should be, right? It should be A, M, D, G, which is grace. All for the honor and glory of God, right? You know, I, 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 I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you some encouragement because you're looking at me somewhat with jaundiced eyes right now, okay? Somewhat cynical, no? Is consecration to Mary. How do you start off your day? Do you consecrate yourself to Mary? Do you take that seriously? No? So you give your eyes, right? Your ears, your mouth your tongue, your hands, your body, your feet, your past, your present, your future, you give all to Mary. Do you remember the image given by St. Louis de Montfort? He 
he tells the story of a poor man or pauper who wants to present an apple to the king. What does he do? He just throws it to the king? Like a baseball? Take it, king? He, he get, she gives it to the queen, and the queen, what, she polishes it, purifies it, places it on a golden platter, he puts a flower there, spray, okay? Then she gives it to the king. What does the king do? Hello? He accepts it. Why? Not because of the pauper giving it, but rather because it's given through the one he loves most, and that is the queen. So I really believe one way in which we can really purify and magnify our intentions is by living our consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary more intensely. Because Mary is going to purify it. Everything Mary did was for the honor and glory of God. Amen? Okay, 141. But my torments are coming to an end. The Lord is giving me the promised help. I can see it. I can see in it two priests, namely Father Andrash and Father Sopochko. Father Andrash and Father Sopochko. During this retreat, before my perpetual vows, I was set completely at peace for the first time. By Father Andrash, and afterwards I was led in the same direction by Father Sopochko. This is the fulfillment of the Lord's promise. So, as a result of her prayer, she God, God bestowed upon this great saint two priests who would be directing her during the course of her life all the way up until she's going to die at 33 years of age. Uh, Father Andrash was a Jesuit priest. So for the rules of discernment and decision-making, we'll be able to pick up the bad spirit from the good spirit. God gave her this, this Jesuit, very well-prepared Jesuit, can be able to listen to her and give her proper advice and direction. Father Soposhko was a was a diocesan priest. He's already blessed now, Michael Soposhko. He's already blessed, he's already been beatified, and he was a university professor at one of the nearby universities. So in Father Soposhko, She's got the Ignatian dynamic. And Father Sopochko, she'll have the dogmatic certitude of what's going on in her soul is not going to be spurious or questionable or some type, some type of pseudo-mysticism, but it's going to be authentic, dogmatic truth. How good God is that God sent these two, di two very different priests but both of them helping to form one of the greatest saints in the modern church. So I, I'd like to con con conclude with three ideas from our, our lecture this evening. First is, um, let's pray for our spiritual directors. We have a lot of them here. We have a, lay, a lot of lay spiritual directors and pray for our directees. I think we have to pray over that. Because a lot of these wonderful people, they're in formation trying to 
uh, really become better and better directors and directors. Pray also for the directees. It's a, it's a two-way street. Two-way street. Second is, um, let's pray that uh, we will grow in love. That we'll grow in love. But not to think that love is always going to be manifested in great things. Living out love is sometimes in the ordinary, monotonous, routine, drab, boring, <laughs> grind of the daily of, of our daily existence. We all have the grind hmm? in one way or another. Don't expect to have you know the Fourth of July explosions every day. Okay? But then she also says, love is capable of great deeds. And I'd just like to end on, uh, on, on the great deed of Blessed Miguel Pro. The way, that he, the way that he died is beautiful, and for anyone who has Mexican descent, this is like almost like, it should be a feast day for you. Miguel Pro was living during the time of the Cristeros. He's going to die in 1927. He's falsely accused and arrested. There was a bomb that was exploded, uh, that a car that he used to have, and they blamed him and his brothers for that. So they threw him in jail. He was incarcerated. One of his brothers was left free, but the Mexican police wanted to nail the Catholic Church through Miguel Pro. Miguel Pro also was a Jesuit. He was a Jesuit with a keen sense of humor and always had stomach problems. No? Yeah. He had to leave Mexico, he had to go to California, California, Spain, Belgium, then he wanted to come back to Mexico because he wanted to, he wanted to offer himself as a victim soul for Mexico. He wanted to offer himself as a victim soul for Mexico. He wanted to give his life for the Mexican people. He loved them, and we have a lot of Mexicans here. So there he's arrested, and they decide that he's going to die. And he, he rejoiced over the fact that he was going to die as a martyr. So the executioner, I just read this a couple hours ago, the executioner on his knees begs him pardon for the fact that he's, he has to kill him. Miguel Pro said, you're thanking me, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you that you're going to send me to heaven. So we ask for some time of silence so that he can examine his conscience and make a last act of contrition to God. He wants to make sure that he's well disposed. Then he's got, in one hand he's got a crucifix, in the other one he's got a rosary. And there he is before the firing squad. And the last words that he says are Que viva Cristo Rey. Que viva Cristo Rey. So they pull out the guns, they shoot him, he, he doesn't die right away. They've got to give him another shot in the temple. And he dies. They try to quell this, the, the Mexican police, but it was the biggest funeral in the history of Mexico. They couldn't keep the crowds from coming in to visit who was really their, their hero, the martyr Miguel Pro. So let's end. Que viva la Virgen Guadalupe. Que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. Que viva Cristo Rey. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Hail Mary, 
full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and have a great night.